the man with you, a man most miserable, one of those who fought nine years for Priam Citadel, then sacked that stronghold in the tenth year and sailed back. But since his men had sin sinned against Athena, she sent harsh winds, harsh seas as punishment. Then all of his brave comrades died, but he, impelled by wind and wave, has reached your realm. Now Zeus would have you send him home at once. His fate is not to die here far from friends. He is to see his dear ones, find again his high-roofed house, return to his own land. These were his words. The lovely goddess shuddered, then answered Hermes with her own winged words. You gods are cruel and more jealous than all others. If a goddess beds a man and wants him openly as her dear husband, then you begrudge her that. Your envy punished rose-fingered dawn when she embraced Orion. You gods at ease, your least desire of peace, sent down chase Artemis of the gold throne, and she and Delos killed him with her shafts. And when fair-haired Demeter dared to clasp Yasion, they mingled breast to breast upon a field where plows had worked three furrows. Zeus did not wait too long to find that out, to kill him with a blazing thunderbolt. So now, you gods resent my having chosen a mortal. But when flashing lightning sent by Zeus had smashed his ship and sunk his men, and there, alone along the wine-dark sea, he clutched the keel until the waves and wind had, catched him, had cast him on my coast, I welcomed him. It's I who fed him, I who took him in. I hoped to give him immortality an endless life, and yet without old age. But since there is no god who can elude or slight the will of Aegis-bearing Zeus, let this man meet his fate on restless seas. But there's no way that I can help him leave. I have no ships at hand, no oars, no crew to carry him across the sea's broad back. Yet I am fully ready to advise him, keep nothing hidden from him, so that he may make his way back to his own land safely. Stout Hermes said, However this may be, take care to send him off at once. Beware of Zeus's wrath, lest in the future he become your unforgiving enemy. Then sturdy Hermes left. And having heard the message sent by Zeus, the bright nymph went to generous Odysseus. He was seated along the shore. His eyes were never dry, and his sweet life was squandered as he wept for his dear home. He now took no delight in her. The nymph no longer pleased his sight. By night, indeed, within Calypso's cave, he slept with her. So side beside they lay, the willing and unwilling. But by day, his heart was rent by torment as he sat along the sands or on the rocks. He watched the never-resting sea and, watching, wept. Standing beside him there, the fair nymph said, Unhappy man, don't stay in tears with me. Do not destroy your life. Most willingly, I set you free. Come now, and with your bronze axe, chop down stout trunks and build a broad-beamed craft. Let cross planks serve as sides for those base beams to carry you across the fog-dark sea. Within that hull, I'll stow much bread and water and red wine. You'll not suffer thirst or hunger. And I shall clothe you and provide fair winds to carry you unharmed to your own land. If that is what wide heaven's gods demand, I must give way before their powers and plans. The patient, bright Odysseus, shuddering, replied to what he'd heard with these winged words. Goddess, I know you've something else in mind, something beyond my being free to leave. In urging me to cross the dreadful deep, the dismal, dour abyss, aboard a craft so makeshift, even quick and agile ships, blessed with the favoring wind of Zeus, would fail. I shall not board these fragile planks unless you, goddess, swear to me, swear to set aside all thought of harming me with new pernicious plots. He spoke. Calypso, lovely goddess, smiled. Her hand caressed him. Her reply was this. You are indeed astute, not short on wits. What cunning urged you on to this request? I call as witnesses the spacious sky and earth and waves of sticks that flow below, the most exacting, the most awesome oath the blessed gods can swear, that I forego all thought of any future harm to you. My thoughts, my plans for you, are only such as I myself might seek were I to be in your place. Within my breast, I keep no heart of iron. I feel for you your needs. That said, the lovely goddess led. 
He followed her quick footsteps. Together, man and goddess, they reached the hollow grotto. There he sat on the same chair that Hermes had just left. Calypso set before him food and drink of every sort that suits a mortal's needs. Then she sat opposite the bright Odysseus. Her handmaids offered her ambrosia and nectar. Their fare was ready now. Their hands reached out. And when their thirst and hunger were appeased, mm -hmm. the lovely goddess was the first to speak. Are you, Odysseus, man of many wiles, Laertes' godly son, still keen to leave straightway? Is it your native land you need, dear, your dear home? Though you go, I wish you well. But if your mind were to divine the trials that fate will have you meet before you reach your country, you would choose to stay, to keep this house with me, and live immortally. This you would do despite your longing for your wife, for whom you yearn each day. And yet I'm sure that I'm not inferior to her in form or stature. It's not right for mortal men to contend or vie with goddesses in loveliness or height. Odysseus, man of many wiles, replied, Great goddess, don't be angered over this. I'm well aware that you are right. I, too, know that Penelope, however wise, cannot compete with you in grace or stature. She is not more than mortal, where, whereas you are deathless, ageless. Even so, each day I hope and hunger for my house. I long to see the day of my returning home. If once again upon the wine-dark sea a god attacks, I shall survive that loss. The heart within my chest is used to patience. I've suffered much and labored much in many ordeals among the waves and in the wars. To these afflictions, I can add one more. These were his words. The sun sank, darkness came. Richard J. Bernstein, Vera List Professor and Chair of Philosophy, the graduate faculty of New School University. I want to speak about Seth, the person and the man. Um, we've come, and the theme of my remarks is a theme that he was much concerned with, the theme of temporality. I want to speak about the present, the past, and the future in regard to Seth. I think of this as an occasion which is primarily a celebration of a magnificent life. I think anybody who knew Seth, in whatever relationship, would not come away being inspired by this human being. It's very hard to think about Seth without thinking about Plato. And I was thinking, as I prepared my remarks, of those opening sections in the Republic when Socrates first begins to describe the traits of the true lover of wisdom and speaks about the combination of various kinds of opposites and how these have to be harmonized and balanced. It seemed to me that these were extraordinarily appropriate for Seth. He was, as a human being, remarkably gentle, remarkably compassionate. I had many experiences which sometimes surprised me of sitting on orals of examinations, students who could be extremely nervous and sometimes weak. And Seth, who had this command, complete, of the classical world had almost a kind of maiotic ability to draw out of students things that they didn't even know. This was the same Seth with this gentleness and a kind of kindness who when he spoke in class always spoke with that authority of wisdom. He taught at the new school for a span that covered almost four decades. And as I became, indeed, he is a person who is in our department, taught longer in the philosophy department of the New School than any other individual in the history of the New School. He was brought 
as a relatively young person, this is the first element of the past, by a great generation of scholars. He was selected by Hans Jonas and Aaron Gerwich and Hannah Arendt to instruct or to have our students benefit from his knowledge of classical philosophy. And in a way, for me, who came to New School only 12 years ago, Seth was always a link with that great tradition uh, of it. For many a year, when I interview students of why they came to the New School, there were many reasons, but in every year, in every class, there are students who will tell me that they came to sit in the classes and participate and learn from Seth Benedetti. And as some of you know, it became almost a joke. There were students who returned year after year after year, <laughs> long before they, after they had any degrees to come and here, because no class, no individual class with Seth was anything less than a vital and profound and new experience. But it's not only the connection with the past of the new school. I like to go back deeper into the past, to Chicago. Um, it's not well known, but I was there when Seth was there. I talk now of a half a century. In the late 40s and early 50s, I was only on the fringe of my educated friends in the committee and the students of Leo Strauss. Much has been written about Chicago about that time, but I've never seen anybody who's really captured what really was distinctive about the University of Chicago in this rather extraordinary period. It was the sheer intensity, the sheer intoxication, the collective eros of the life of the mind. And I remember, I was in my late teens when I was an undergraduate at the University of Chicago, that somehow we all thought, or we were educated to think, that the highest of the high were the classical scholars. They were those who sat next to the Lord on high. Um, and so for me, Seth Benedetti is a person that throughout his life conveyed and epitomized that distinctive eros, that distinctive sense of the life of the mind, which was so manifest for a brief period at the University of uh, Chicago. Um, when I think of Seth, I don't simply think of him in terms of the past and the present. He was scheduled to teach, and the students were looking forward to a course that he was due to teach this spring, but of the future. And here, it's hard, again, not to think about Plato. And that wonderful passage, that crucial passage in the Phaedrus that the poet, philosopher, player Vido puts in the mouth of Socrates, where Socrates likens the dialectician to the farmer who's got the capacity to sow the seeds into the right soil and to cultivate them and to watch them grow. Seth's legacy is that he has sown those seeds in many of us, his colleagues, his friends, and his students. And I'm convinced that they will grow and that they will live on and that Seth lives on. Thank you.